So, so this panel has got the subject of um, really the potential for London as a cap on hog, but also uh, more importantly as it relates to lawyers, as Burke I covered in his speech, the whole range of insurance and securities, particularly non-cap at Lloyd's. And I'm joined on the panel, I'm pleased to say, by Lisa Lehman from PRA, Shireen from um, Gallagher Re, and, and Philippe from, from Tiger Risk. And we're going to cover quite a broad range of topics related to a focus on cap bonds, as requested for Steve, but also expanded into generally ILS. But the main theme is around the, the opportunity within the London market. And, and I'm quite encouraged by the volume of people in the room, actually, Steve. Uh, it just shows the interest that there is within the London market to, to this little niche sector of insurance linked securities and the opportunity that London does provide to become a more meaningful place from which transactions can actually happen. So if, if I can kick off, um, and as some of you will know, I was involved in the task force, as was Mr Wade sitting in the front row, uh, way back in 2015-16 that, that helped in the development of the legislation that was passed by government in 2017 to, to respond to the, the opportunity for London to be uh, more involved in the whole issue of reinsurance risk transformation. And there was quite a bit of a fanfare when that legislation was passed, but since that legislation has been passed, uh, I think it's been uh, fair to say that the transaction success has been a little lacklustre. There's probably been a handful of successful transactions, particularly early on, um, but since then it's been um, quite slow progress. Um, so probably the first question to you, Lisa, representing the regulator. Um, what factors do you think have contributed to that so slow start in developing ILS uh, within the London market? And what changes in approach do you think are required to enable the market to achieve its potential? Um, thanks very much, Des. Um, as I think you know from our conversations, um, this has been um, high on our agenda for some uh, months now, and we've been uh, reflecting very carefully, <coughs> excuse me, um, on our on our experience, and we've been engaging very closely with uh, market participants and some familiar faces in this room, really to try and take some views on uh, precisely this point and what we need to change. I think the first thing to say is that our regime is still relatively uh, young. And uh, for the whole of its existence, um, there's been a very established hub, um, and that gained clearly a very strong first mover advantage, and that's undoubtedly had an impact, and that's, that's context that we cannot change. Um, but aside from that, um, we think from our discussions with the market to date that there have been a number of issues that have really contributed to the UK regime seeing um, a much lower number of transactions and we're really actively trying to address those um, those points. Uh, specifically the very clear feedback um, from the market is that the cost um, of transaction and time to market are important um, as is the need for an appropriate amount of flexibility and confidence about what regulators uh, will accept. So timely decision making is important but culturally we also need to be really easy to deal with um, as a regulator in how we go about our approvals and to be uh, properly and appropriately proportionate. So I think those are the, some of the factors that, um, that we've had from the market um, on our, our approach um, at the bank. So we've definitely made some changes already to enable faster processing, uh, more proportion, proportionate review, uh, we're focusing only on the key documents and clauses, we're not looking at the full suite of materials. Uh, we've responded to concerns about flexibility, so for standard transactions, we won't require all the documentation to be on the face of the SOC, for example. We'll allow more template documentation. Um, and all that taken together will also mean that variation of permissions are, are needed um, uh, more seldom. Um, the other set of um, things we're trying to do is just have a very kind of standard um, approach for standard transactions, so sort of the, the kind of things that we're talking about um, here today, particularly um, uh, cap bonds. Um, so anything which is sort of wholesale, general insurance, standard ILS structures. So our aim is to get those done within four to six weeks. Um, and the last two cap bonds that were issued in the UK have been done uh, within four weeks of the application being made to us. But for the non-standard stuff as well, we'll also have a sort of two-week pre-app process so that um, 
you know, where, they, where we're doing something we haven't seen before, we'll, we'll very quickly get to a view on what are the sort of issues that we would, would need you to address. Um, we hope by doing all of that would just be much easier to deal with, but also increase certainty for applicants about the kind of things that we're, that we're um, engaging on. And you'll see that we're consulting uh, on some of this already. I think there's also there, there's some structural reasons why the UK regime has been um, less attractive. And we are consulting on some other changes, um, such as allowing group companies to seed to um, one cell, so that ILS in the UK can be used for things like group aggregate cover, which, um, which other regimes um, enable. And also changing our, our approach on things like legal opinions, quantifiable risk, and, and some of the SMF applications, uh, just to try and take some of the friction out of the system uh, where, um, where it's not needed. Um, the last thing I'd say is that I think there's still a lot more to be done. Um, <laughs> so we're definitely continuing our dialogue with the market. We're open to suggestions of more fundamental reform, uh, including reforms that might result in changes to the regulations over time. And if you have things to say on this, please, 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 I would love to hear from you. So that's my plug. Um, in the meantime, I would say um, if you're planning on doing something like this in the London market, do come and talk to us. Um, you might be pleasantly surprised by what you find. Thanks, Lisa. Um, you covered quite a wide range <laughs> of topics uh, and issues there. So before I offer my view, and as some of you know, Lisa and I have been talking, uh, along with Burkhard, for several months as we've uh, developed the application for London Bridge 2 and, and, and got the permissions, and we actually launched that vehicle to the Lloyd's Management Agencies last night. So it's pretty early stage, but the early feedback is very positive. And at least a credit to Lisa and her team. Um, you know, I've been involved in the London market and ILS for quite a few years, and it's really refreshing to see the change of approach. And your the fact that you're actually listening and considering the feedback we're giving. And I think fundamentally for me, this this time and the, the, the authority you've given Lloyd's to transact and the speed at which we can and transact makes us competitive. We, yep. You know, I would never expect London to replicate Bermuda. You know, it would be wrong to go down that road, but we could certainly close the gap, and I think we have closed the gap. But the proof's going to be in the transaction success, mm. not any authorisation yep. that's sitting on our, in our inbox. Yep. Um, Shireen, mm -hmm. do, you, do you just want to sort of give your perspective on what you've heard from Lisa, how encouraged you are by those remarks? And, and probably more interestingly, what do you think the opportunity is for London in terms of transaction flow and, and at attracting institutional money to support the wide range of uh, risks that are written in the London market? So I was wanted to talk about you know, the London market appetite for third party capital to support the growth and the risk management strategies within the market. And um, we're seeing appetite from UK MGAs algorithm-based syndicates like Kai and Vave, who are writing on Lloyd's paper. And basically, there will be strong appetite for alternative risk financing, mainly due to the governance associated with writing on Lloyd's paper. Um, the main issue with, the Lloyd's, with London being an ILS hub is three key things. So the tax regime, um, the legal costs, and the regulatory regime. So for, for example, in Bermuda, um, there are standard legislation that's designed for securitization. Um, within the UK, there is um, a legislation, but it's not as standardized as Bermuda, so it's difficult to compete with this. And then the main thing that also drives the, um, the slow start um, within the ILS in London is the legal costs. So for example, in Singapore, what really helped progress that market when they first, first started it is the um, the funds that were there to, to cover the legal costs within the Singapore market. Um, so maybe, a st and one thing that um, Lisa mentioned um, that could actually help uh, kickstart this is the standardization of some contracts. So come up with a standard um, contract like covering, for example, US went um, with one modeling variable, and then that would help reduce the legal cost associated within um, securitization. But then the other thing I wanted to mention is um, trade capital has been pulling back from the funds at Lloyd's. And so um, the London Bridge facilities have helped bring new capital to the market. Um, 
so that we've seen so over the past two years, so in 2021 and 2022, alternative capital helped fill some of the gaps. So I think potentially um, securitization of non-cat risks, with Bermuda being a, a, a dominant hub for cat risk, could be the way forward. Um, and especially when on casualty and legacy risks, where the duration of these um, risks um, can help enhance the returns from the investments. So, um, so if, for example, um, if you're only securitizing long-tailed risks, um, you, you can actually leverage the duration of the reserves that, um, that would come into those vehicles by earning interest rates on the investments backing up those liabilities as you um, underwrite capital into these vehicles. And so that could be one way to for the Lloyds, for the London market to promote itself as a non-CAD specialty hub for ILF uh, market. So for example, there's one more thing I wanted to mention. So in the Lloyds um, market, uh, if you want to uh, write a legacy deal, so it's a reinsurance to, reinsurance to close arrangement, it has to go from one syndicate to another. So for example, the legacy players, they have established um, their own legacy syndicates within the Lloyds market. So for there, we've seen that there, are, there has been some appetite from investors mm -hmm. to invest in legacy deals or legacy risks. So one way to do this is um, use the London Bridge facilities to open, um, to also securitize retrospective risk. And um, that could be, there could be a huge demand from um, syndicates to release um, reserve risk. One, due, uh, the first thing being to inflation, but also um, reserve risk tend to be a drag on your capital and drag on your returns. So, um, one, um, so there could be a demand for adverse development covers and aggregate covers from syndicates. And, um, and so the, it's, it's a win-win. So investors are looking for a different um, alternative form of invest, investment to enhance their returns. So um, in, on top of cat risk, but so looking at other forms of securitization, including legacy, and it's a win-win for both sides. So that could be one way. These are my two cents. I'll stop here. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Thanks, Shreen. Uh, so I don't know which, which one to pick up on, on, on the wide range of things you, you've covered there. I was quite interested in watching your reaction, Lisa, when there was a suggestion that London might want to consider covering the... Uh, the setup cost of a, an ILS vehicle, as they see in, in Singapore. And I won't ask you to comment on that one. You can if you want. <laughs> if you want to offer a comment on that. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's fine. I mean, there's some really interesting uh, comments and thoughts in there. I mean, the first thing I'd say is we have not given up on the, uh, the cat bond market. Um, so uh, I'm not willing to see that uh, to Bermuda. Uh, that's not where we are. Um, and a lot of what I've said has really been sort of aim particularly at the sort of general insurance um, wholesale uh, short tail uh, yeah. stuff. Um, so, so that's absolutely our focus and I'm not giving up on that. Um, uh, on um, sort of legacy and longer tail, I think that's really interesting and, and clearly there's scope uh, through London Bridge to, to explore that um, a bit more uh, on the casualty side. Um, on uh, fees in particular, I mean, you know, clearly we have noticed uh, what Singapore has been doing on fees. We don't think that's the right thing for us to be doing in the UK. And I think Sam, when he spoke to the select committee, our deputy governor earlier in the year did make that point. Um, it, it's probably not where we're going to go. So um, it's nice of you to throw it out there, but I wouldn't want to excite anyone's anticipation. <laughs> our, our real focus is on making um, our approach as standard and simple to use as possible and also stripping out some of the legal costs which you know, the market has told us dealing with us and our approach to legal opinions has been a real issue. So we're definitely stripping some of that out. So, so I can um, be positive on some things, but, um, but uh, not, I'm afraid of the Manage point. expectations on others. Yes. All right. Uh, Philip, to bring you into the conversation, I mean, uh, clearly Tiger Risk uh, have got some good momentum going in, the, in their ILS team at the moment, and you've been involved with some cat on transactions. Um, and I think there's been three or four London-based issuers that have actually issued cat bonds recently, certainly in the tw last 12 to 18 months, and everyone's decided to issue out of the Bermuda market. What, what, what do you think um, London needs to be doing to um, perhaps persuade those issuers or potential future issuers in the London market to consider London as a viable option for their next 144A issuance? Yeah. 
Yes, I think, one, I think it, it, it's, it's obviously very good to see that there's an ongoing dialogue, and I think that dialogue will certainly help to bring more business into London, especially from an ILS and, and kind of Catbond perspective. Uh, the second item to be said is, is uh, it is a process. Also, I think, I mean, when we look at Bermuda and Canaan, for example, um, I think if you go back to, you know, 2010, there were, uh, I think when we look back, I think there were five Catbonds being done out of, out of Bermuda, 50 out of Cayman. Mm -hmm. And if you run the same statistics today, I think you, you obviously find a very much reverse order. So I think um, um, having a proactive regulator who's willing to listen to feedback, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily get too discouraged about the timeline. And obviously everybody <laughs> wants to, to have things happen kind of quicker. But, but, but I think just yeah, putting other jurisdictions into perspective, I think, is helpful. Um, and, and I think it's going to be interesting to see um, in new jurisdictions like Singapore and, and Hong Kong and otherwise how, how they are faring from a kind of a long-term sponsor support in, in those jurisdictions. I think that's to your question on kind of how, how can Capon sponsors in particular be encouraged to kind of come here and, and what's their thought process and, and why did some of them choose to go to Bermuda, I think. Um, I mean, I, I, I think the three points, and I think Lisa, you mentioned that always, um, cost. Um, kind of time to market and, and maybe the, the regulatory certainty and, and flexibility. Um, I think the speed to market is probably kind of the key one for, for mm -hmm. many of those, um, especially in, in, a, in, a, in a market time like today where um, bringing a transaction to the market when, um, when, when, when everybody wants to basically proceed with is, is I think, important. And um, um, so I think that that's certainly one consideration. Certainly, I think costs are important, but, but probably come come with uh, with kind of a second priority. Um, and then I think, as you mentioned, some of the sponsors obviously have some Bermuda affiliation. So uh, I mean, I think it's really a, a head-to-head -head race between where to go. And I think sometimes the time to market might shift uh, might, might shift those um, to maybe another jurisdiction. But again, I think that being said, it the more transactions are going to come here, the more comfort people will have that things get executed and, under, and, and also understand where there might be difficulties with the regulator to get something approved and others where there's no difficulty and things can maybe be accelerated. Mm -hmm. But I think on the priority list I think you had, I think that approval speed for very standardized transactions, a lot of those were index type uh, kind of transactions are relatively straightforward mm -hmm. for collateralized short tail, yeah. short tail business. Um, that uh, certainly if, if there can be further improvements being made, I think this is going to likely be helpful. If it might be an unfair question, Philip, and, 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 and I can ask this now because I don't see it in a broker, <laughs> but do you think broker dealers generally consider London as a viable domicile to execute a 144A transaction? Yeah, I think they do. And again, I, I mean, I think it's similar to Singapore. I think, I mean, there's, um, and, and now Hong Kong, I think, I mean, generally we present clients with the range of options of jurisdictions, and those range from Bermuda, Cayman, London, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And I think each of those jurisdictions have other considerations. Or with some of it, it might be cheaper, but it might be more burdensome or less predictable. And and at the end of the day, it's really a decision between the the broker dealer and the client on on where to go. And and like I said, I think out of all these, I think what we have seen, and I think you see that in the statistics, even for bonds doing, being done out of Singapore, the speed to market is likely the, the biggest priority in a market which is more uncertain than maybe two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, um, but yeah, absolutely. I think whenever we present options to our clients, I think we, we present all those considerations. Okay, cool. So, so clearly Bermuda has emerged as the domicile for choice, not only for 144 cap ones, but a lot of yeah. ILS transactions, and, and there's good reasons that for their success. So, Shireen, do you, do you just want to comment on <coughs> what do you think the London market can learn from Bermuda's success to, to make it a more competitive domicile, not just for, for 144A, but, but also for any you know, uh, reinsurance risk transformation, be it, be it sidecar type structures or, yeah. or, or, or any way where you, you're going to transform reinsurance risk into an investable security. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, the main thing is about Bermuda offering one holistic, you know, sort of positive attributes for the securitization from all ways. So tax regime being the, a, a very good and important one, the legal expertise, the expertise that sits within Bermuda, but also um, the bureaucracy and the speed of also approving the transaction, like you've mentioned. Um, 
And so you know, Bermuda is a well-established market. It's been there for, and, and it, it was the start of the securitization. So what London needs to do is not copy what Bermuda did, is actually try to come up with something different to, um, uh, for example, fill the gaps in the market that the Bermuda market is not um, currently able to deal with, um, but also learn from other jurisdictions that were um, slightly successful in um, promoting themselves as an ILS hub, like Singapore, back to the, mm. the, the grand scheme, which I think that would really um, help mm. with the, to kickstart the London market mm. as an ILS hub because of the legal costs that are, you know, from what we've, we're seeing, are, um, and it, it's a big hurdle for, for uh, promoting this market. But also, um, you know, so w one thing about the, the Singapore, um, a grant scheme, so it did um, also, it has been extended, so it did start in 2018, it was up to 2020, but, 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 but due to its success, it was extended up to 2022. So that was uh, the main uh, point. So, thank okay. you. I'm not yeah. going to push you on the grant scheme. <laughs> you can try. I know, but I won't get anywhere with that. So, uh, so, from a regulatory perspective, I mean, clearly you're taking feedback from London market participants, mm. and and you you are responding positively to, to that feedback. As you consider what to do and how to, you know, supervise and authorize <laughs> applications in the UK, can you just talk through? You know, did you go to other jurisdictions? Did you, you know, look at how they, you know, regulate, you know, the ILS market, and and what sort of lessons did you draw? From those jurisdictions, as you as you developed your own approach towards regulation in, in this market. So most of the work we've done has been taking feedback from the market directly. Um, you know, clearly we we uh, talked to Bermuda um, uh, from a London market perspective and also an ILS perspective, um, and we've got a very good sense of how they do things and how they operate. Um, uh, and we've looked to across the world at what others are doing, particularly um, Singapore, but not only there, there's a number of jurisdictions which are, are starting to play uh, more actively. So we, we definitely have an eye on it. Um, uh, there's no doubt about that, but it's actually, you know, from the people in this room, I think that we will get the best insi insights about um, what we can do to, to change and um, continue to improve. I completely take um, Shireen's points um, around uh, the, the overall approach um, of the regulator in Bermuda and uh, being really quite focused on um, uh, making sure that you know, the, sort of the conditions are right for um, the business uh, that they want to see done there. I think from our perspective, really, this sort of co collaborative culture, cooperative working, um, and um, you know how we operate relative to others has an impact, not just how we operate um, how we operate for ourselves. And that's definitely um, an area that we're focusing on. We're very, very sensitive to how we how we work with applicants um, in this area, but also the clarity of the risk appetite, certainty of transaction. That's also um, that's also important. Um, so there's definitely work um, we need to continue to do, and we would absolutely acknowledge that. But I think we've made huge strides in how we engage um, uh, so far. Um, but we do want to hear hear more. Um, if there are things that we can and should be doing, then um, then I would like to know because we would like to do them. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Um, so, Philip, the, the the ILS market is dominated by US property cap. Um, probably no surprise there because that was really the motivation for a lot of the capital coming in in the early years and certainly the wave of capital that came in after you know, after the financial crisis 2009, 10, et cetera. But with the recent experience in property cap, which has uh, disappointed some and surprised in too many areas, um, there has been a bit of a shift in looking at other parts of, of the uh, insurance and, and the reinsurance world. And, and you'd, you'd have heard what Burkhardt had to say about, you know, uh, the, the range of risks that are available within the Lloyd's market. Um, how sustainable do you think that shift in um, exploring other asset classes actually is within the investor base? Is that is that a permanent um, directional move, or is this a temporary reaction to a, a few years of, of disappointing returns uh, on, on the property side? And if it does become more sustainable, and I'm trying to anticipate your question here, um, 
do you think that's part of what Shireen's talking on? Is there's something that, you know, that's where London and Lloyds in particular can develop its unique proposition for the institutional investor base? Uh, yeah, so I think one, I think to, to your first part of the question, I think the, 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 the trend of investors being interested in non-catastrophe risk, I think in our perspective is sustainable and it is, it is goes back to the roots by investors looking at the space in the first place or they're looking at it from a non-correlated type perspective. I think the only reason why they shifted to property first was because it is short tail and that it's easier to quantify. Um, I think the big question on kind of the non-cat space is going to be can you solve that or, or, or obtain capital through things like catastrophe bonds or other structures, or does it require more kind of a partnership approach, what London Bridge, for example, does, or more kind of in a, in a quota share type kind of um, structure, which kind of, and I think it goes back to what, what Berka mentioned before as well, or seeing Lloyds really more as a fund manager, so to speak, and, and having the managing agent really act as a, as, as a fiduciary of the capital in that sense. Um, um, obviously, having somebody fully understanding the risk profile is going to be important for investors before they put capital on the line. Um, and, and I think, kind of going to the second part of your question, um, I think that's indeed, at least from our perspective, where London can find a unique position in the marketplace because th 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 there seems to be really two approaches. So one, you can try to beat Bermuda from a cost perspective or from another perspective, but, but again, I think we we're talking about important costs, but they're generally far less important than the risk being transferred and, and want mm. to be accessed by investors. Um, so I think, um, yeah, ha having, a, ha having London as a risk hub where you can transfer risk investors are looking for, uh, and I think we mentioned before, so with mechanisms to deal with longer duration risk and, and liquidity throughout the, uh, throughout the life of the risk, I think is going to be uh, is going to be important and are, in, uh, I think, fairly crucial elements. Um, so, yeah, I think our side certainly is something we will see more of, and, and we certainly see a clear trend from investors who have fairly full allocations on the property cat side, have a very good understanding about the space, and are looking for other allocation opportunities with a similar non-correlated risk profile, and non-cat certainly fits that fairly well. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, I think that that's probably... Um, a trend where we'll see more transactions going forward. Yeah, I think I think you make a really important point about cost, and it's important to keep that issue in context in terms of transaction costs in relation to the overall value of the risk transfer yeah. being undertaken. And and, and I think uh, and I was pleased that Lisa picked this up earlier in in your comment. The the, the ability to respond quickly to market opportunities is, mm. is really really important. And I know you've given us that flexibility with London Bridge, and we're really um, grateful to you for it. But it, it is like looking at the, con the the transaction in the whole rather than trying to isolate little bits of it and, and seeing you know, whether that's you know, overweight or underweight in terms of the cost perspective uh, is, is a really important point. So, but also just picking up on like London's potential USP, um, and you talked a little bit earlier, Shireen, about uh, legacy mm -hmm. risks. Um, that's probably the question I've got there. It's really around the economics of non-property cat. You know, the economics of property cat are pretty clear in terms of its non-correlation benefits, and and if you don't get surprised by the events, you know, the relative value yield opportunity. How how do you see those economic values? Um, how how do you contrast what's available in the property cat market to what might be available in the Yep. in the specialty market or in particular you touched on earlier the legacy side yeah so i think it's mainly around the duration of the risk so um you know with currently we have we are in a rising interest rate environment um and so the herder rates that would be required on cat bonds um so cat risk would be higher because if you know if you're re interest free rates you're, you're you're making more money then the margin above the expected loss would be higher and so that um, could be mitigated, well, and another um, attractive uh, proposition to investors is to look at um, casualty risk or legacy risk, where this rising interest rates can actually be leveraged into enhancing the returns on top of your technical premium that comes from the underwriting. And so then that would help bump up your internal rate of return and then meet the herd rate. So that's, I think, more around the economics of um, securitizing non-cat risk and within the specialty market. So casualty risks and as well as legacy. Yeah, right. But also, it also depends on the level of investment freedom 
that will be allowed within those, uh, within those vehicles. So one way that could be, um, you know, the way it could be structured is to tranche, tranche the capital. Let's say if it's a sidecar, mm -hmm. tranche, um, tranche the capital in a way so that the top margin within the capital effectively acting as the surplus above your, you know, a, a certain solvency ratio or a certain um, event return period, then that could be used to invest into more non-vanilla vanilla type assets to enhance the returns and bump up the economics. But those type of economics are, um, you can, it's easier to achieve this form of structuring to enhance the economics within an alternative vehicle for non-cat risks versus cat risk, which tend to be short-tailed and event-driven and it's mainly in liquid assets. So one way to leverage the rise in interest rates could be mm. uh, looking at other forms of uh, risks. Okay. So, yeah. so, so Lisa, so expense grant number two, one, <laughs> two, <laughs> leverage on the asset side. So if you can begin to look at those. Um, so I, well, I think we've got about seven or eight minutes before I, I bring this session to a close. I just want to give you the opportunity, if anyone does have a question in the audience, I'm happy to field that. If not, I'll carry on. I've got a hand up over there. I think some microphone coming. Uh, thank you, David Coulthard, a private investor. Um, you talked, Lisa, about, uh, I mean, sorry, let me rephrase. The Bank of England have done a lot of work to change their position and become incredibly helpful uh, from what I'm hearing. Um, to what degree have you been involving with the Treasury talking about taxation? And are we finding any uh, compensation coming from that side as well? Because taxation, think of Bermuda and how it got going after catastrophe. Taxation was an issue for them blossoming as they did. If you want to blossom, you need the Treasury on board. Have you got them on board? Thanks. So, um, <clears throat> so we are definitely um, we are definitely engaging quite closely uh, with the Treasury. Um, we're not talking to them about tax policy. Um, so, where concerns or issues are raised with us, and obviously we will pass them on. Uh, but we're not actively trying to shape tra tax policy in this area. That wouldn't be something that we would we would want to do. That would be a matter for them. Um, so, if there are things that that need to happen or you think ought to happen then um, I, th I think, you know, we'd be interested to hear about it, but it really is a matter, a matter for them. We would not uh, be involved in shaping any of that. They are very interested in the work that we're doing, and clearly they have a very strong interest in the success of their regime, um, uh, having spent so much effort and energy um, with us setting it up um, in a relatively small number of years ago. Um, so if there are ideas and things that um, we ought to consider, then then definitely happy to hear it, but, but it is really a matter for the Treasury and we would just direct you there, I think. It's a really good question and it's an important question because you're right in that Bermuda are, and I'm not going to put you in an uncomfortable position, Lisa, I, could, I can hit, feel your eyes digging into me. <laughs> um, but but it, Bermuda's advantage is that coordination between regulation, tax, and, 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 the, and the legal and the legislative side. And, and the UK, we don't totally have that sort of coordination between those various bodies of government. Um, but the tax legislation here is pretty simple and pretty clear and, and delivers you know, zero corporation tax, no withholding tax, free of stamp duty, providing the two conditions need to be met. One condition, you file your tax returns and pay your your tax fines if they're due on time. And secondly, the main purpose of the transaction is not to seek a tax advantage. You know, fundamentally, providing the transaction is not driven by tax, um, tax or anti-tax avoidance type measures, then, then these vehicles are there to be used and, and are competitive. And that's not too dissimilar um, from what goes on in Bermuda, but that decision around tax comes from the advisors to HMRC. And, and that's where there clearly needs to be coordination and efficiency. And, and ultimately, if you know, Lisa and the PRA have done a tremendous work to free up the regulatory side, and if for any reason there's issues on the tax side, and I'm sure the Treasury will put the same um, questions to HMRC as what that, that Lisa's had on the, on, on the regulatory side. You know, the Treasury is very motivated to give London the chance to be successful. 
and, and they are very receptive to hearing from market participants, including people like myself and Philippe and Shreen, as to what's getting in the way of that success. Because you can see in the audience today, there's a lot of people got a vested interest in, in this market in London being successful. Thank you for your question. Any more, or should I crack on? Oh, there's one at the back. We heard this, is Clive O'Connell. We heard this morning about the need to grow ILS into direct corporate ILS, and also, obviously, sovereign risk ILS is a very attractive thing, particularly to a jurisdiction like London. But at the moment, one can only bring corporate and sovereign risk ILS into London if one goes to the expense and bother of using a fronting insurer. How can we get rid of that impediment? Do you want to attempt that one, or would you like me to field that? Or, Philip, do you want to jump in on that one? I don't, I don't mind. Yeah. Do you want to have a first attempt, and I'll jump yeah, in? Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, so one of the things um, I said in my little spiel at the start was that if there are things that need to change, including to change about the regulations, then, um, then I'm interested in hearing it. Uh, clearly, that would be a very big change for the current uh, the current regime, which is very much focused on the sort of um, uh, the regulated um, angle. Um, so it, it would be a big shift. Um, you're not the first first person to say that to me as a way forward. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, if there are things that we need to consider, as I said, we're really open to considering them. Um, so yeah, uh, happy to talk. Yeah, Cl Clive, the legislation is as the name implies, reinsurance risk transformation. So it needs to be business seeded by an insurer through to a reinsurer who issues the securities. That, that's, the, that's the basis of, upon which the legislation has been drafted. And, and you know, in, in ILS, and, and Philip, jump in if, if you think I'm misrepresenting this, um, we do have a lot of corporates and, and sovereigns talk to us about accessing this market to, to, to transfer their risk and, in a way, questioning whether they need to go through an insurer or a reinsurer. I think the, the basic problem is it, it's the insurable interest that's being transferred. I mean, we do see parametric structures, and some of them do actually go through things like captives or fronts, as you say. Um, but with that, there is cost and execution risk. Do you, do you want to Yeah, no, I think that? we, I mean, and I think uh, Michael from the World Bank spoke earlier. I think, I mean, there's certainly um, transformer vehicles and, and the World Bank in particular, I think, facilitates, facilitates a lot of these transactions. And I think, as, as Des said, once, once you shift to kind of parametric kind of type deals or being at you know, Google or other ones who have recently accessed the cat bond market, I think these structures exist. Could you go one step further and basically use, a, use Lloyd's as kind of a transformer facilitate? I mean, that's this sounds like, like a topic to be considered maybe kind of going forward, but I, I think the key will come down to can, can in, in insurance from a regular, regulatory perspective be provided in the home country of whoever that corporate or sovereign is. Um, so so that I think that, that's obviously an issue which needs to be further discussed, I would imagine. Okay, thanks, Philip. I've been given the nod. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for my panellists for your contribution. I hope you all found that interesting and um, thanks for your time.